So up first, we have um, so we have Amrita Sengupta, who works as a digital researcher, and her interest lies at the intersection of gender, technology, and society. Um, she graduated from the Oxford Internet Institute in 2016. Um, she's also pursuing a, car, a course in cyber law and is looking into the legal implications of AI in society. And Amrita is going to present on collective identity in digital spheres, feminist movements, and struggles for public spaces. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, collective identity online and specifically three case studies of India and Pakistan, three uh, movements online, Why Loiter, Girls at Tabas, and Pichrato. Um So before I start off, I'd just like to give a little bit of histo historical and political context of South Asia. The access of public spaces is a social issue in India and Pakistan. And while the you know ratio of women to men is almost 49 to 51, even so, there is a need felt to reclaim public spaces because on grounds of safety and um, other patriarchal setups, access to public spaces is limited to women, limited from women. Um, in terms of social movements, while social movements have existed in the past, uh, women have been assembling in virtual spaces of social media to demand greater access to public spaces. These points raise questions about how such communities form identities online, whether there is a reimagination re of the public, private, and the virtual sphere, and how these spaces get negotiated. While there is some literature on the role of women online and how collective identities get formed, there is little research on how digital uh, women's movements in South Asia are being carried forward and the norms they seek to challenge. So, like I said, I'm going to look at three particular movements in India and Pakistan. Pinjra Thor, which literally means break the cage, by Loiter, and Girls at Thapas. Um, so, the first movement is called Pinjra Thor, which was started in August 2015, where uh, two student activists uh, 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 reacted to a circular by a leading Delhi Institute, which cancelled late nights for its girls, which is basically women have uh, student accommodations where they have deadlines to get into, so women were revolt revolting against, against this particular aspect. In this student struggle, social media platforms were used extensively for the purposes of mobilization, for garnering support, and getting signatures on petitions being filed to the government. The next, pro uh, the next uh, case is called Why Loiter. This was basically a book that was written in 20, uh, 2011 by three professors in Bombay, who spoke about women's right to just access public spaces just uh, you know as a form of being as a form of liberation this was particularly uh, became, becoming important in 2012 when there was a brutal uh, case of gang rape in delhi uh, by uh, after which you know there were some hashtags which were started on facebook and twitter and women started demanding more of these right to access public spaces the third movement is called Girls and Thabas, which is, uh, Thabas are basically stalls, tea stalls, where women want to be able to go there and not get stared at. So what they saw is that the, this blog featured photos of women hanging out at Thabas, drinking tea, eating, reading, and just being as an act of liberation. Since its inception, this campaign has gained support from women across South Asia, and uh, women are encouraged to access social media and put photos on their Tumblr and or Facebook and Instagram pages. And like you see that you know there are, they use a lot of imagery. There is a use of it. there is a very uh, you know vast visual culture which is surrounding these movements where they use accessories such as tea. They use uh, you know cycling events as props to talk about uh, the movement. Uh, now, before I get into my findings, let me quickly uh, talk about the theoretical framework in which I situate this research. Uh, first is about social networks for social movements and how they have been used. Uh, so, uh, various scholars have theorized online activism in this liminal third space, a place where traditional rules governing society can be set aside. Uh, this idea of the third space assumes that space is not empty but is socially defined by the contrast between what is experienced in this space and what is imagined for this space. The second aspect is about the whole identity formation and collective identity online. So there is, uh, you know, existing research on how the internet transforms collective action. And, you know, Postmus and Brunstein asked the question as to whether this medium potentially physic isolates physicality or does it in fact strengthen, strengthen existing social movements. 
Then I also look at the public, private, and the virtual sphere. While the traditional understanding of Habermas's public sphere is invoked, I also look at Papa Grassi's uh, view of the internet, which is a new public space for politically oriented action. And I also look at Dana Boyd's concept of the networked publics, which is relevant to this study because it relates simultaneously to the space constructed through network technologies and the imagined collective that emerges as a result of the intersection of people, technology, and practice. Uh, now, situating this research in these frameworks, uh, there were a few themes uh, that emerged towards uh, this study. The first one was to do with personal biographies and how it played a key role in access to public sphere. Uh, I, uh, just before I get onto that, the methodology that I adopted was that I did 23 in-depth interviews with women across these three movements, and I also did a discourse analysis about, uh, of about 60 visual images, which included posters, which included pictures of protests that women take on the, on the streets when they're protesting, and um, also of artwork. There is a lot of artwork that is involved in the visual, so I coded all of those images as well. Uh, so the first thing to stand out from the interviews conducted was the explicit importance that personal biographies played in identity formation. Now, I, here I have some quotes that uh, you know were verbatim from the interviews that I conducted, where women spoke about the lack of access to public spaces, and these restrictions were not just by the external society, but within their families themselves. Like one woman uh, from Pinchatur told us that I have never been allowed to move freely by my family. This has hampered my personal growth and confidence to the extent that I now have poor spatial cognition and I have to struggle very hard to visualize roots and spaces. So her point was that when I liked that page, it was not so much about the greater ideological understanding of women and public spaces, it was more to do with my individual need to have, uh, you know, to revolt against this kind of curfew and the behavior of the authorities in my college who are constantly trying to curb my freedom. Um, while personal biographies did play a role, some others said that they were particularly instigated by the, by the lack of access and by the caged mentality of the society. So the second uh, uh, quote that you see, even though I have not been personally affected by any adversity in public spaces, I strongly believe in this movement because very often I feel suffocated by the fact that women or girls are restricted to their homes. Um, so these were some of the you know reasons why women were coming out in numbers and participating in these movements. Um, once again, there was a extensive use of visual imagery. It, what you see here is essentially a, a, a poster that was created by one of the women students who talks about what are some of the things that she aspires for. Um, I think sitting in New York, it is difficult for us to probably imagine what we're talking about in the context of women's hostels in India, where you know 7.30 is a deadline by which women are expected to come back while men can stay out till as long as they want to. So, so they, their demands are very simple, that I wish when my wishes are not reduced to some few words on an application left, they were left at the mercy of wardens and uh, uh, the parents and the police. So they, they want to break this shackle of policing that they experience on, in their daily lives. Um, what we also saw was a convergence of movements. Why Loiter, which was a book written in India, was often very uh, generously used in the Girls at Tabas movement, where they spoke of the fear of violence in public spaces real. However, they also spoke of that at the same time, the presence of violence should not preclude the possibilities for women seeking pleasure in the city. So there was often this convergence of movements simply because they did not have access to the physical public and through this virtual space, they were trying to create that visibility about that lack of access. Uh, the second, the second theme was around, you know, the social media platform used and how that had a role in uh, the degree of collective identity which was felt amongst its members. So it was clear that, you know, Facebook was the most used platform across these uh, across these movements. But what was interesting was that, however, it was assumed that while Facebook is the most used platform for organizing and mobilizing, the most involved participants identified highly with the movement on WhatsApp and not on Facebook. Um, so they, the, the, and the reason for that was Facebook was viewed as something very public, while WhatsApp was a more secure network through which women felt safe and they thought that it was a safer space for them to interact. Like we heard in one of the interviews that while I trust the members of the community, the fact that it's Facebook and it is a public page, I do have to monitor what I say. My sense of ideological oneness is heightened in the WhatsApp group as I'm more comfortable there to speak my mind. This was felt again across the various uh, movements we looked at. Um, 
and it was also interesting that, uh, in fact, one of the you know the sense of self-categorized identity being formed on an instant messaging app over a platform like Facebook posed certain questions. Participants also spoke about the lack of internet access, which is you know a very important point for us to consider, especially with context to South Asia, was that they did not have access while growing up, and they felt the need to be careful while posting online. Like the Pinchra Thor founding member told, told us, she said that you know a lot of women do not have lack of uh, smartphone access, and when they organize, it makes WhatsApp a preferred medium of use. This brings us to the point of intersectionality. Uh, I briefly touched upon post-colonial theory, which uh, has informed this research a little. Uh, so not only are the subaltern women of India and Pakistan treated differently in post-colonial studies, but the voice of women who are marginalized due to class, caste, gender, identities often get unheard in such movements. And we also want to caveat that in this movement, it was clear that every woman who, was, who I interviewed was privileged was uh, well educated, was from a middle class or an upper middle class background. Thus, seeming Seven in India, which spoke about uh, Mother India, which was this ide idealistic woman who, uh, uh, you know, is able to be nationalistic and uh, up, live up to all the patriarchal requirements of society. So this move, this this particular um, poster was saying that we won't Mother India, which is to say that we do de we decry the you know existing patriarchal norms and we don't uh, uh, agree with the nationalism that this kind of uh, you know imagery um, uh, calls for. Um, um, and lastly, just one last point is that you know the access to the online public sphere was only seen as a means to the end of access to the physical public sphere. So while all of these women were or, or engaging and organizing in these movements through the online space, they were seeing this as a means to the end, which is to access public spaces in the physical realm. Um, so I've been told that I'm running out of time. So yes, I'll leave us with this uh, thought for now, and you know we can look at the other images when we have more time. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. That was really good. And this reminds me that um, I'm always really happy that we, when we manage a theorizing the web to have panels where there's people doing research, not just in the Western kind of societies, but also you know, in other places, which apparently prove, you know, to have very different pictures of what citizenship means, what gender means, what politics means. So, so it's it's really great that, that I think this panel is doing a really good job on that. Um, so our next presenter. Anastasis Germanidis is a Greek engineer, a researcher, and artist. He studies the effects of new media on society and creates tools for augmenting human creativity using machine learning. His project Antipersona was one of Wired UK's best apps in 2016, and he's currently a graduate student at NYU ITP. So Anastasis uh, is going to talk about Sybil Society, which is a very mysterious title. But that means he will himself tell us what what it's on about. Cool. Thanks for the introduction, Tanya. Uh, my talk is titled Civil Society, Part 1. Consider split brain cases from medical literature. These cases, dating from the 1950s, involve neurosurgical patients who had their corpus callosum, which is the bundle of neural fibers connecting the two brain hemispheres, severed as a part of drastic treatment for epilepsy. In one of the experiments done with split brain patients, a split brain child, Paul S., was asked what he wanted to be when he grew up. When the question was posed to the post left hemisphere, he wrote, uh, an automobile racer. When the other hemisphere was asked the same question, Paul S. had a different response, a draftsman. Uh, philosopher Derek Parfit famously used such cases of split brain patients to argue against the necessary unity of consciousness, the idea that the brain can only support one stream of experiences, a uh, singular personhood. Consider Fernando Pessoa, the Portuguese poet who published under 75 different personalities. She called those personalities heteronyms, and each had its own distinctive history and voice. Alvaro de Campos was one heteronym. He was an engineer who sailed to the colonies and embraced the futurist movement. Ricardo Reis was another, a doctor who got a classical education and supported monarchy. 
It's unclear what Pessoa's exact relationship to his heteronyms was, but it's clear that he didn't just view them as uh, figments of his imagination. Indeed, he proclaimed that he divided all his humanness among the various authors, and that he considered his identity as, uh, of Fernando Pessoa as less real and less substantial than any of those fictional identities. Consider the Tulpa community on Reddit. Tulpas, and the term is derived from Tibetan Buddhism, are defined as autonomous consciousnesses that live inside one's brain that have their own opinions, feelings, and form. People on the Tulpa subreddit deliberately try to cultivate th those Tulpas, and there are very detailed uh, guides out there for how to achieve that. Uh, those guides reveal that growing a Tulpa is not necessarily an easy task. It can take hours and hours of practice for a Tulpa to achieve sentence. We live in a society that operates under the principle that one brain equals one agent, one vantage point, one identity. And that to be functioning in this society means experiencing everything through that one identity at all times. Our lives are structured around fulfilling the desires of that one identity. We try to associate our identity with the best opinions, the best taste, and the best politics. And we're convinced in the moral right of that identity expressing itself in the world. But what those examples and multiple other examples uh, suggest is that identity can be conceived as a kind of a fiction or a disciplinary tool to hold bodies accountable for over time for their actions and behavior. And strange and fascinating alternatives exist to the dominant paradigm of identity. Part two, consider Sybil attacks. Uh, a paper by uh, John Ducher at Microsoft Research demonstrated that in the absence of a central authority to verify the identities of uh, nodes in a peer-to-peer -peer network, there is no way to prevent someone from creating multiple fictitious identities to command outsized influence in the network. Even though the original uh, usage of the term was referring to peer-to-peer -peer networks like BitTorrent or Tor, it has since been used in the context of social networks in any situation when one can generate uh, multiple fake accounts to, to promote a certain viewpoint or claim to make it appear more popular than it actually is. The name Sybil comes from the pseudonym of the famous psychiatric patient with 16 different personalities whose case study popularized dissociative identity disorder. Sybil attacks, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, have been all over the news over the past year. From Russian Sybils being deployed to destabilize our media environment, to fake follower factories enabling instant fame through the purchase of thousands of Sybils, social platforms are facing increasing public pressure to deal with Sybil attacks. And they're responding through some public uh, rituals where they exercise Sybils from their platform. Advances in AI will only make Siebel's more potent. The emergence of machine learning based impersonation methods that produce uncanny reproductions of people's voices, facial expressions, and so on, creates a not so far-fetched future in which Siebel's become indistinguishable reproductions of real people. Attempting to protect their legal identities from being reproduced seems increasingly futile, as all the recent data breaches from Equifax to Cambridge Analytica so on, uh, demonstrate how impossible it has become to escape the Byzantine network of ad networks, data exchanges, credit reporting agencies, and so on. So how do we deal with this uh, reproduction of identity? <coughs> Maybe we can consider uh, Walter Benjamin's 1936 essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. In this essay, Benjamin discusses how the mechanical reproduction of works of art, or the ability to copy and mass distribute those, those copies, would forever change how we appreciate and perceive those art objects. Once artworks can be so easily copied, their aura inevitably disappears. By aura, Benjamin refers to the uniqueness and authenticity of an artwork, or in his words, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. Let's consider identity reproductions from Benjamin's frame. Personal identity, according to Irving Goffman, has the assumption inherent in it that an individual can be differentiated from all others, and that around this um, means of differentiation, a single continuous record of social facts can be attached. What happens when undifferentiated copies of ourselves become possible? When there is no longer a one-to-one -one correspondence between bodies and identities? when there is no single body to which one can attach those social facts. It's hard to tell, but perhaps the aura of the individual, much like the aura of art objects, will diminish as identity production becomes more and more feasible. So perhaps instead of investing our time trying to cultivate one identity, as we do now, 
it might become a necessity to rely on temporary, more pseudonymic identities or symbols, each characterizing by a more or less clear function or context, be it an intellectual, an emotional, or political one. Under the threat of reproduction, compartmentalizing our identities might become the only resistance strategy we have available to us. Part three. I believe that art can play a significant role in assisting us in this rethinking of identity. Much of performance and conceptual art can be seen as a way to playfully explore new forms of identity without committing to them. And I'll offer a few examples. Uh, Roberta Brightmore was a project by media artist Lynn Hersman Leeson. In this performance, which lasted four years, the artist created a completely made up identity, that of Roberta Brightmore. To become Roberta Brightmore, Lisa not only had to change her appearance, including clothing, makeup, and alternate body language, she also had to make Roberta Brightmore socially and institutionally real. To do that, she created her own bank account, credit cards, driver's licenses, and made numerous friendships under her alternate identity. To conclude the performance, Lishan hired three other actors to become Roberta Brightmore clones, in some sense open sourcing her own uh, the Roberta Brightmore's identity. Another example, the essential guide to performing Michael Mandiberg is a guide created by artist Michael Mandiberg for the purposes of teaching others how to behave like Michael Mandiberg, <laughs> including how to replicate his uh, behavioral traits, his social behavior, uh, his uh, beliefs, his opinions, his family history. And then I'll end with two examples of my own work. Um, so Ante Persona is an app that simulates uh, the experience of using Twitter as if you're signed in from any account of your choice, providing a window into someone else's social media point of view. With this project, I wonder what is the ex uh, difference between experiencing my own identity online versus experiencing someone else's identity. Is it possible to uh, share identities with each other, turning them into a new kind of commons? My most recent project is called, uh, like the title of this talk, Civil Society. It's a participatory experiences that aims to train people on how to become other people. Participants in civil society choose fictional identities and have social interactions in public spaces, receiving real-time instructions on their phones for all their dialogues and actions. Once you have selected an identity, the algorithm generates a scene based on uh, your identity and the identity of a user nearby. And a scene is generated based on your respective identities. Uh, examples of scenes include meeting your best friend, going on a date, breaking up, doing a job interview, or having an existential crisis. You can continue living the life of that identity for as long as you like, leaving more and more scenes, uh, glimpses of that, uh, I, the life of that identity. Then you can decide to become someone else. Thank you. We're doing exceptionally well on time. Anastasis was so disciplined. He's got two minutes left, so so we can all engage in some role play, perhaps. <laughs> but also, what a great idea! Maybe for the next theorizing the web, we'll 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 bring the game in and just have everyone engage and have everyone adopt different identities. Certainly, interesting implications for citizenship. Um, so we'll uh, move on. We'll have to. We have two more really great talks. Um, the next presenter is Colin Kielty. He's currently a PhD candidate um, in political theory at the University of Virginia, where he works on the notion of enfranchisement within democratic theory, specifically as it relates to emerging digital political practice. And Colin's presentation is also uh, called Digital Enfranchisement and Nodal Citizenship. So thanks for every, to everybody for coming. Uh, my talk will probably be by far, um, actually let me start the stopwatch. Um, by far the shortest, uh, by far the most boring and stodgy of the panel. Um, and that's because I think unlike some of my other presenters, um, I'm interested in the received pictures um, of potential civic agency associated with digital technologies and how these received pictures have been transmitted to us. And so the talk takes a historical look at what I call vocal citizenship. 
um, and how that model of citizenship migrated into discourses about digital politics. And then it suggests that thinking about citizenship as voice can be a surprisingly limited framework. And finally, the digital technologies themselves help bring out what I call a nodal model of citizenship. Citizenship is being active and inactive and intentional relay in circuits of transmission, circulation, and distribution. And that isn't just in play for folks on Twitter or what have you, but also how we can think about the substance of citizenship gen uh, generally, attuning us to important dimensions of what we actually do and what we want to do well as citizens. So I will actually well, most of the talk is dedicated to trying, trying to illustrate this distinction. And I'll start off with a, a not entirely digital um, slide. And this was originally a video before it got cut out in the, in the transfer of the files. Um, and it's actually a really old clip. So this was originally the introductory video for the, video for the very first season of American Idol. And the reason for starting here is because American Idol actually represented perhaps the most concrete manifestation of a long-standing democratic fantasy that's, instant, that's easy, instantaneous, and mass electronic voting. So originally voting was done by text and phone, but it migrated to the web around 2010. So this is actually a series of screen caps from a text. They're, they're also blurrier because of the, the file transfer. But they're from a, a 1940 text by Buckminster Fuller, um, who wrote a long, largely unhinged prose poem about television and voting. Um, in the 1970s, political philosophers and even government officials began to take up this idea of implementing instant referenda, first through television, then through wire, and then through as the 1990s came along, there was the notion that we could implement this through the internet. Um, and actually, Tim Berners-Lee himself in 1999 was still thinking in precisely these terms. So he's describing social machines, which was his pet term for the World Wide Web. They'll allow us to do things we just couldn't do before. For example, they will allow us to conduct a national plebiscite whose cost would otherwise be prohibitive. So there's a, actually a fairly significant tradition of thinking about the political significance of digital technologies through their extension of a vocal model of citizenship as direct enfranchisement, as voting. Um, so today, e-voting may be questionably secure, and in places like Alaska, where it is in effect, it's neither instant nor easy. Uh, but along with American Idol, it represents a, a paradigmatic way of thinking about citizenship as enfranchisement. You have your own individual take on the performer, candidate, or issue in question, and you get a say by being able to project on pixels or on paper your voice directly upwards into some defined decision-making process. And in general, I think we tend to imagine the political functions and value of digital technologies as a reflection of what we think they ought to do, as, a, um, as reflections of a pre-existing picture of citizenship. And so in this case, because being enfranchised is such an essential component to being a full citizen, the political imagination instinctively drifts along these kinds of terms. And so... This was actually an article, this is taken from an article in the Washington Post just after 2012, uh, which was a reflection on the fact that there were more American Idol votes than there were votes in the presidential or votes um, in the election in general. Uh, and the notion was that if only we could migrate the kind of civic practices that we want from American Idol into the real world, um, we would have a much more successful democracy. But there's a second way of thinking about the vocal model of citizenship as it relates to digital technologies. And this is as a more literal kind of voice. So, I'm going to slide here. Um, these are slides taken from different bulletin boards spanning, I think, roughly 1987 to the early 1990s. And since the emergence of bulletin board systems and other text-based conversation platforms, the web has also been thought of, and perhaps more consistently thought of, on the model of the public sphere, a place where citizens don't vote, but where they can still project their civic voice beyond the ballot box. So Howard Rheingold's seminal 1993, The Virtual Community, explicitly adopted a Habermasian public sphere idea, and early work in community 
computer-mediated communication made the same explicit connections to Habermas, uh, somebody who was very influential for thinking about the web in the early 1990s. Um, this were, the work in computer-mediated computer communication was much more specialized and niche than Ryan Gold's. And then blogs later seamlessly fit into this way of thinking about citizenship, giving credence, even more credence to, to the vocal model if from a slightly different angle. And so this is how I had been thinking about the vocal model of citizenship, breaking off around roughly two dimensions, and both dimensions being represented in the ways that scholars and early theorists had understood the civic potential of the web or the, the nature of civic involvement on digital platforms. And I see these things as being roughly two sides of the same coin, not essentially different ways of thinking about citizenship. They're both things that digital technologies could help us do better. But we think about, this in way, think about them this way specifically because they are things that we're supposed to do better. The received pictures idea. Moreover, I think these two ways of thinking about vocal citizenship share an underlying set of three basic characteristics. One, they're individualistic. So the premise of the model is that it's your own personal voice, voted or verbal, that's at stake. And the second is that they're matters of projection. Being able to get your personal voice out there or into some other circuit of decision making, getting it counted or listened to in a way that confers power on the speaker or ballot caster. And finally, this projection is, in a sense, direct. You want a direct line to the ballot box or to your audience free of interference or noise with other voices coming from other views or voices and without getting, having your voice changed or modified. So one way of thinking about the limitations, oh, it's a little bit darker up there now, of this model of citizenship is that it reduces citizens to shouting into a void. Um, and there's actually been a decent amount of work on the structure of networks on social media platforms that are much more hierarchical than they are horizontal. Um, political scientist Matthew Hinman has done research on this, and he draws a lot from network researcher um, Albert Laszlo Barbasi. Um, so a small group of users and sites command a vast majority of uh, visitors and followers, and thus a vast majority of voice, a disproportionate amount of voice. But I think there's reason for thinking that, and this is actually the, the networked illustration. So there's reason for thinking, however, that voice is not necessarily the best way of understanding the kinds of activities that people engage, the kinds of civic activities that people engage in. And that rather, that personal direct projection, what I've described as the vocal model, is actually secondary to an underlying form of civic practice, relay, relaying and circulating opinions, information, and affects, moving content that is not personally yours from one user to another or set of others, and thus playing a role in establishing distributions of ideas and attention. And I think that there are roughly three features of nodal citizenship that can correspond to the features of vocal citizenship. So in the first place, it's impersonal. The activity is undertaken by you and directed by you, but it's not necessarily tied to being an expression of your own individuality. So retweets are not endorsements. Um, it's distributive. It plays a role in creating the patterns of what people see, react to, think about, and focus on, even if it's not fundamentally, fundamentally about about you persuading or arguing with them. And finally, it's routed. So it's a horizontal practice that doesn't focus so much on getting into a circuit of power directly on, and on its own, but instead generating the critical mass of attention or concern that generates power by way of other people. And I just, I have the, like the, the retweet icon, the share icon, and then the Instagram heart icon. Uh, the last one to acknowledge the fact that routing is ag algorithmically mediated where interactions like liking play a significant role in what people see and pay attention to, uh, but it's in a less direct kind of way. 
And finally, I suggested at the beginning that this notion, this model of citizenship with these three features is generalizable. It's not simply the case that it applies on social media platforms like Twitter or Facebook. I think it also has a direct analogy with how we think about literal enfranchisement at the ballot box. So just taking, for instance, the distinction between being individualistic and impersonal. So in the first place, casting a vote itself can be a pretty crap way of expressing any personal or individual meaning or preference or whatever. People fret that their voices don't count even when they vote and even when their preferred candidates win. Um, precisely because they don't see that candidate as representing or listening to them. They just think they'll be less bad than the other person. So voting can be a highly impersonal and yet can be highly impersonal but still yet matter. The second is the distinction between projection and distribution. So when talking about the influence of actually casting a vote, an individual vote tends to actually causally produce very little, and there's a lot of discussion and philosophy about the significance of individual votes, um, but it does embed you in the circulation of enthusiasms or just in the circulation of unenthusiastic willingnesses to vote that mobilize coalitions which do collectively exert pressure and influence. And finally, the distinction between being direct and being routed. So your own citizenship happens as much through others as it does through you, through building those coalitions by circulating ideas and affects. Um, where what you're capable of relaying also depends as much on what other folks think, feel, and say, and themselves relay, as it does on what you thought, felt, and wanted to relay in the first place. So the curation of a network, um, the specific shape of one's nodality, is itself a civic act. Uh, and I have a few concluding thoughts, but I also have nine, eight, we'll end there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Um, excellent. So, so we've talked about um, citizenship as resistance or resistance as citizenship. We've talked about identity performance as citizenship. We've talked about citizenship as nodality and voice or lack thereof. Um, but we can also, of course, talk about labor and jobs, which is what our final presenter is going to do. Um, so we have Kave Azar, who's, um, who is an MSc student in social science of, uh, of the internet at the Oxford Internet Institute. For the last four years, he's been working as an internet policy analyst, and he's worked with Article 19, Small Media Foundation, and Freedom House. Uh, and today, Kave is going to be presenting on uh, uberization of jobs and the decline of deliberative democracy in Western European democracies. Uh, thank you so much, and also impossible task of trying to be interesting after uh, these presentations. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm talking about how uh, the move towards uberization of jobs is affecting the dem democracies in, re in, in uh, Western democracies, where there is mature and representative democracies with periods of deliberative democracies in between elections. The reason I use the term uberization rather than uh, gig economy is much used term is because uh, apps such as Uber actually don't uh, introduce gig uh, uh, infrastructure and dynamic to a lot of jobs such as taxi drivers. They already existed in terms of gig terms, but they come as power brokers and restructure the work, um, the, the work dynamics and between service provider and service receivers and sit as a stronger middle uh, middleman person. And uh, I think Uberization kind of encompasses both uh, characteristics better. In a lot of literature that is talks about Uberization of the work, there's been quite a lot of interesting discussions about wealth, effect of, effect of Uberization on wealth and welfare of the workers whether they are better off or worse off in monetary terms and whether that high affects their health to be working on gig, gig economy and Uberized terms. There's also been a lot of discussion about fragmentation of the legal protection as a result of the Uberization of the world. But I think what has been missing from the conversation is effect of Uberization on democracy and democratic practices in mature democracies and representative democracies. And I think this narrative ignores the historical value of work to working class communities, uh, the historical role of trade unions in influencing policy on behalf of working communities in, uh, in societies. 
Some of the examples that I think in my work has inspired me um, uh, in kind of my research and in my work outside academia is the example of the Chartist movement in the UK in 1800s where pushed for mass um, reform and extension of the, uh, well, uh, creation of democratic rights for workers and at the time working men. The South Wales miners in 1900 in South Wales in UK were pushed for uh, uh, better monetary policies for uh, miners in the absence of a Labour Party, which was a representative of the workers and trade unions. And also the civil rights in movement in US and the LGBTQ uh, movement in UK, where they, um, their relationship with the trade unions was that they used the infrastructure of the trade unions for a lot of their advocacy, but also trade unions use the solidarity throughout their advocacy work as well. I think all of these examples, they are examples of what I would call uh, class bargaining or political bargaining as examples of where trade unions or the worker collectives ask, uh, have demands outside uh, bargaining with employee and employer and outside the working condition with, with, the, with the direct employees uh, relations. And also the argument has been made that in the mature Western democracies, and I use Western democracies because a lot of the term of Western democracies, because a lot of the theories that I'm working on, uh, it kind of focuses on the dynamic of the trade unions in the terms that is defined by in Western democracies. And um, the, the trade unions, through the class, rep uh, class representation, uh, act as a stabilizer in the democracies. So in between election, through deliberative actions, they represent workers where other institutions fail to represent and worker and working class communities interest. With the rise of digital work, whether being like through Uber or uh, through uh, Amazon, uh, digi uh, Amazon Turk and so on, we've seen different forms of resistance. So like Uber drivers turning off their Ubers at the same time to forcing a surge on the machine, or Amazon Turk uh, users using the add-ons on Chrome's to um, uh, people who outsource them jobs and so on in terms of payments. But my focus is on, the f uh, on a specific group in the UK, independent workers of uh, Great Britain. I, IWGB, which is a newly formed collective and not recognized as a union in the UK, uh, which works with outsourced workers, cleaners and so on in universities, but also works with people who work in this Uberized kind of working environments, main, namely Uber drivers and delivery riders in the UK. Delivery is like Uber Eats, kind of same similar service. And, um, so I'm, I'm focusing on a number of things uh, when I'm studying their, uh, their work and their influence in, in, as a political bargaining and class bargaining agent. One of the things that I focus on is the characteristics, in, and I do that in contrast with traditional trade unions in the UK. So the Trade Union Congress in in UK, which represents the wider uh, collection of trade unions, traditional trade unions in the UK. And uh, not only the IWGB is not a member of TUC in the UK, but also they have found themselves in opposition uh, in number of practices and policies to TUC members or TUC in general in the last few years. So I'm examining the, examining the power and influence through four case studies in the UK, which doesn't look at the relationship and the victories that they have managed to win over Uber and Deliveroo through repetitional damage, but focuses on the relationship with the governing bodies and institutions in the UK. I'm looking at the relationship with the UK Parliament, particularly the select committees, which will fit into the policy making decisions. I'm looking at uh, the relationship with local government, particularly with the mayor of London, uh, and the um, Transport for London authorities, which ha ha at the moment is involved in a case trying to revoke Uber's license. I'm looking at their judiciary advocacy role that they play, which is a huge part of UK traditional trade unions in terms of advocating for workers' rights. And I'm also looking at their engagement with the um, government experts and government uh, report, uh, people who do government reviews and so on. In all these cases, that is with the exception of judicial, and this is a research that is ongoing at the moment, and it's part of my thesis that will be uh, finished in the next few months. But a part of, uh, with the exception of the judiciary, in all other aspects of the, that I've talked about, I have seen already a weaker relationship between the IWGB as a representative of workers and these uh, institutions uh, as opposed to traditional trade unions. But there, there could still be hope in terms of how these trade unions or these, these collectives come to shape um, policy uh, in the, 
and fill the gap that is left. So one of them is using online platform networks for political advocacy in the shape or form of like social campaigns such as Avaaz that we've seen in the last 10 years or so that not only have uh, for, uh, formulated political campaigns but also formed communities uh, outside of traditional realms of co political communities. Formation of geographical interest groups. So example of that is uh, is a St. Pauli club in Hamburg in Germany. So some of you might be interested that a young younger metropolitan group of um, people who moved in that area kind of formed different identity and around the St. Pauli football club and it became a vehicle of ad advocating for uh, cultural and politically progressive ideas in Hamburg. Also, we can look at the idea of incorporation of sex workers in unions in the UK. Uh, so traditionally, sex workers have been viewed as undesirable member within the traditional unions in the UK and Europe. But in the last few years, through persistence and advocacy, they are they're part of the mainstream union movement in the UK, and they, they, uh, idea, their ideas and policies is being advocated. And the final form that they might um, uh, get the, uh, the policies advocated in uh, this new as a new vehicle is true new politics. This is a picture of Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald, the new leadership of the Labour Party. This is about a year before they became the leader of the Labour Party and in a protest which was organized by IWGB. And um, but at that time, Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell, and IWGB, all three of them as entities were very much at the margin of the politics. But over the last three or four years, we can see that it has changed, at least for John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn. And similarly, around, around the world with uh, movements such as like uh, the campaign around uh, Bernie Sanders in the US and also in Spain and so on as well. So we see the new institutions for policy advocacy is being formed, which this new workers collective could tag along to as well. But I think the challenge still remains that the working class communities need, 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 need networks of cooperation and solidarity and not just networks of protest and rage which is uh, uh, organized around rage or hope uh, in temporary terms. Um, and I think this is a very important time right now to talk about this, uh, the representation of gig workers in, in, in um, in uh, democracies and uh, deliberative democracies, mainly because of the growth of these forms of job, which it has a lot of um, uh, racial, gender, and generational injustice comings with it, but it also the move from a lot of the governments to regulating this job. So example of the, of the Transport for London uh, authorities, where 40,000 Uber drivers' job is being regulated without uh, authorities consulting them, is something that we would never see in, in, in other industries. So we need to, at the moment, think about uh, better ways of uh, looking at uberization of jobs and its effects on democracies. One of the ways that I want to um, uh, suggest that might be a better framework to think about the idea of uberization of jobs and its effect on democracies is a theory of rentier state, which was developed at first in 1960s about Iran by Matt Abbey, and then later on, um, um, in 1990s was developed on looking at case studies of Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And this looks at the economies where uh, it's not based on production, but is based on uh, a value extracted from the communities by outside companies. And they argue that that, uh, that creates a weak relationship between income and work. And we can see that being reflected with a lot of conversation around basic income, where it's being advocated both for the right and the left at the moment. And uh, they argue argue that this kind of uh, weakening of relationship and weakening of workers' institution leads to a weaker relationship between citizens and governments. And the, the, the big picture argument of the rentier states is that rentier states, because of this weak relationship between the citizens and government, because of the nature of economy and the, re the work relationships, they find it difficult to uh, develop to fully grown, stable democracies. Now I think that, like, there's a lot of caveat that comes with that in terms of foreign intervention and so on that we know six, 40 years later on or so. But I think this again presents us with a good kind of um, reflective framework to look at how uh, are the some of the democratic institutions that we have that is, has, have been organized around works, jobs, and employment could lose their importance for a huge subsection of uh, society. And I think it's, now is the time to think about it before the regulations are set and a subsection of society is completely left out of the democratic discussions. Thank you.
Excellent. Uh, this is a question for the first speaker. I'm curious why there was a focus on, um, or I understand why there was English, but why was there any efforts to diversify the languages used? And if so, if not, why? Um, so these movements, so your question is, why was there a focus on English specifically or whether, yeah. so, uh, so to start off, I think there is a lack of existence of other uh, languages in the discourse, which is why, uh, you know, English was the primary medium. But also it is important to also say that in these movements, there is a lot of vernacular that is used, um, but whether that affords access to marginalized women is a question that still remains to be answered. But for example, the Pinjratur movement uses a lot of Hindi, uh, which is a mainstream language in India. Uh, in the uh, Pakistani movement, Girls at Thabas, they have multiple posters and visuals, which, uh, you know, are depict uh, uh, signages in Urdu. So there is a, a deliberate attempt to get languages in, but often enough, it does not reach the audience that it is aiming at, simply because they lack the access to internet. Um, for the second speaker, um, I liked how you invoked um, Wilde and uh, Pessoa, and even Benjamin. Um, but um, you said something about, like, uh, rather than have one identity as we do now, um, that, I, I would just question, it seems to me that we actually have many identities, as Wilde kind of pointed out in the 19th century. Do you mean, like, that we should, like, Wilde flout? Um, not try to have one identity, but celebrate our diverse identities or name them like so. Uh, um, yeah, exactly. I think uh, even though we we present ourselves different in different people in different contexts, so in that sense we have multiple identities. Uh, the, ever since, uh, I guess at least in the past decade, the real name Web has kind of become the 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 main internet for most people. And uh, I, I'm kind of advocating for a reaction towards pseudonymity. And there, are, this is, I guess, one part of the argument for pseudonymity, but there is also a lot of, like, it, pseudonymity protects marginalized groups, or uh, it enables self-expression. Uh, and there is, a, like, countless examples of uh, people using pen names to, kind of, to express ideas that the religious or, like, sexist environment wouldn't allow them to. This is also a question for you. Um, I was wondering because at some point um, it was like uh, these um, multiple virtual identities could be some kind of subversive strategy against the current system. And I was wondering because in our current political framework, um, your citizenship and your rights are always tied with your identity because they have to be tied up with the nation state. And I mean, I'm not sure. If this is actually possible, but is there any way to use like this idea of virtual identities to somehow find some subversive strategy that would actually help people who are non-citizens? I'm trying to understand, fully understand that. So, I, so not, by non-citizens, you mean like stateless? Well, either, yeah, stateless people or maybe also people who have a citizenship, but it's not worth anything in the country where they want to go. Uh, yes, so th there is... Uh, there, there, there is, I suppose, two alternatives. One is to uh, uh, operate under uh, pseudonymic identities, and the other, I guess, uh, uh, trend I see is moving towards more uh, group identities. And I see that with uh, that, that has been a historical uh, trend from even like Ned Lute, the mythical uh, anti-technology leader, who never actually existed but became kind of a group identity for for workers going to protest. Uh, and the industrial age. I see that that with those impersonation technologies, they can uh, they can be used in multiple ways. But one of them can be impersonating people, notable people, and kind of through them expressing some ideas that with uh, uh, nameless uh, nameless identities you would not be able to get any voice, any audience for it. I have a question for the last speaker. Um, I've, so you were talking about how the traditional union and the new, were, like the newer formed unions were actually not really cooperating with each other, or some of the tactics wasn't working. Um, I was wondering, like, can you provide exact examples of how that has occurred? Um, just because we know that traditional unions are really fighting hard to stay relevant, and they haven't been, and so people have been finding new 
ways of supporting each other. So can you talk about maybe like the two main characteristics that have allowed for the new unions, for example, to have more clout or political clout, for example? So um, I start by example, like one example where they hadn't been cooperating and so on. So for okay. example, um, uh, in the case of Uber in London, the traditional unions have been very adamant that they don't want uh, the practices of Uber in London and they don't see it as a reformable kind of company in London. So they very much push for the idea of uh, uh, the license being revoked and so on. Um, and whereas the traditional union, uh, the, the, the new kind of unions uh, view it as a um, a company that 40,000 people have chosen to receive income through working with them and therefore you shouldn't deny them the rights of doing that, you should provide them better protection okay. while they're doing that. Um, and I think in terms of like the differences that some of the main differences in terms of the workplace practices, because the new unions are not recognized as uh, workplace unions in most places, now there's a couple of legal cases that they get in temporary recognition, they don't actually have a right to strike. And also striking in, in gig economy or in Uberized workplace, it doesn't have the same effect as withdrawing your labor in a closed shop or in a place that no one can replace you. So therefore they rely quite heavily on repetitional damage and uh, so there's a lot of social media campaigns, direct action campaigns and so on. And I think that kind of, that is, and that's, that's one of the areas that is less transferable uh, as a skill or as a network or as a capital to political advocacy, the same kind of thing at the moment. I think it's possible, but at the moment it's, it's not happening. Hi, my question is for Amrita. Um, I heard about how the, the Modi government and BJP are very technologically sophisticated um, and using you know, social media manipulation and uh, targeting of Dalit and low, lower caste um, activists online. Um, and in the last panel that was in this room, we heard that India, you know, sensibly a democracy, not a dictatorship, leads the world in internet shutdown. So I wonder if you could talk to talk about how this gender justice activism is affected by the current political context. Yeah, it is, I guess, risky, but I'll still attempt to answer it. Uh, yes, so to, to respond to what the Modi government is doing, and I know I'm being reported, so I will be cautious here. Um, so so, so um, in terms of movements and how they're impacted by, uh, you know, Kashmir, for example, has seen the highest number of shutdowns, uh, even if you, you know, sort of compare it to other authoritarian states. So definitely, you know, while on one end, the government is trying to say that we're digital India and they're taking many practices which are supposedly for the betterment of society, uh, you know, be it, uh, for example, I don't know if you know, there is a biometric system which is the largest in the world, which is called Aadhaar, which some are arguing for it to be a surveillance society as opposed to something that can be used for unique identification. So there are various tactics that the government is using in the name of digital citizenship, which a lot of us don't agree with. And how it impacts such movements is also that, uh, you know, uh, there is a very big BJP um, trolling campaign that works uh, against many of such movements, which, you know, essentially, while we spoke of online as a space for mobilization, it is also increasingly becoming a space for harassment because uh, even when these movements, especially if I can speak of the Pinchatur movement, for example, a lot of times they have been att attacked by the student wings of BJP governments because they see these online mobilization and they reach the site of resistance, the physical site of resistance, and there is physical, uh, you know, abuse that is heard. So uh, to, to respond to your question, I think, yes, there are uh, serious concerns with the current government and how it is tending towards authoritarian forms of, uh, you you know, uh, sub uh, marginalizing the voices that are trying to make themselves heard. So the digital concept in itself is uh, diluted and it portrays an image of what it is aiming to be, but the citizens are often seeing it and experiencing it very, very differently and in much more uh, dictatorial ways. Uh, this question is for Colin. Uh, did you, so you mentioned in your talk that there, there was um, this idea of a direct democracy that, that is kind of worked through the social machine of the internet. It was also something that started with television. Um, you, was there anything that was before that that would have kind of uh, given that sort of access historically? Like were people saying, wow, the radio can actually have some sort of two-way function 
where people can vote, or is, was television kind of the first medium where people started thinking that there's like a direct piece here that could add to a democratic process? Um, that's that's really interesting. So I mean, Bertolt Brecht's notion that the radio can be both a trend. I mean, the radio is a fundamentally transformative technology because it allows people to become both receivers and senders. I think that idea about electronic media probably starting with the radio is definitely present. I haven't seen anything in, that suggests that there was an electoral extraction. Um, of the ideas of symmetricality or directness when it comes to radio. And certainly getting into the 1940s, I mean, part of the lament of Brecht is that the radio was then transformed into a fascist technology. And then in the United States, it, you have propaganda research about how, how the radio can be manipulated. So I think that the radio takes a slightly different trajectory in the way that it's taken up, in part of because of the way it was politically taken up in Europe. Um, but there is, you're right, that kernel of early thinking about the radio before the rise of fascism that does share a lot of similarities. Um, hi, so my question is kind of for everybody. Um, I'm wondering, like, um, so state citizenship has like uh, been kind of relying on um, like an understanding of what that citizenship like uh, like entails or how you can or cannot participate um, with new like digital citizenship and like increasingly algorithm algorithmically like mediated like interactions or um, how things work through algorithms. Um, what role does like algorithmic transparency or algorithmic like literacy play in like being an active digital citizen? Uh, I happen to be holding the microphone at this point, and so I will attempt a response. So one of the things that I'm at least interested in is the way in which um, the distribution of public attention has been transformed by the social media landscapes. You no longer have to have mass analog protests in order to get ABC News to cut in during Justice in Nuremberg anymore. You can have hashtag campaigns. Um, and what this suggests is that citizens play a role in distributing attention, um, and that's a form of citizenship that's become increasingly important, uh, but it's also becoming increasingly algorithmically saturated. And so one thing that I'm personally interested in is how, what would it mean to allow folks to exercise some form of distributive autonomy in on social media platforms or in network spaces? Um, I think that's how I think of it, but that's really just a reiteration of your concern more than anything else. Just I'm um, very quickly in terms of like this globalization on platforms. I think one area that I'm interested in doing a bit more work on is the propaganda by, uh, by platforms to consumers, so Uber, uh, famously wherever there's going to be a new law um, introduced that where there's new tax or new kind of delay times or so on, they put that in the design in the platform, so in Australia they did that, the government taxed price or our price, and then uh, whereas like drivers have no say in terms of that communication between the platforms and consumers, so I think one area that uh, again might be like transfer of power, again is that political agency of the, uh, the driver or the service providers being confiscated by the platforms um, in, in immediate. Yeah, so I think uh, going back to the definition of civil attacks, like when uh, you can create multiple nodes in the network, then things like voting no longer are able to work. So I, I think uh, something I'm thinking a lot about is how do you make an uncountable population accountable? How do you uh, how, what, how does decision making look in such a network when, when you no longer have to trust that you know, one person equals one node? And I think metrics such as like uh, likes or like any kind of, from Nielsen ratings to the ratings today in social media, like those, the insiders always know that those are not to be trusted. Uh, so I think it's, an, it's I, I don't know the answer yet, but I think it's, it's definitely really important question. So I think um, um, if I think about it in terms of uh, what's happening recently in India is also the, uh, you know, in response to sexual violence, which was, I, it's interesting on in terms of the contestation between traditional media and how social media is actually, um, you know, putting some pressure on traditional media. So uh, recently there were some accounts of sexual violence which happened way back in January but were not reported uh, till the longest time until there was immense public pressure on social media platforms which forced traditional media 
media to in fact bring those news out and they were against you know big political players in the country so uh, so it's interesting how you know social media in that sense is also mobilizing um, traditional media to actually play a more active role in its discourse uh, than just being biased by political uh, you know parties or corporates or the likes so so this is the, for the last speaker. Uh, in general, I tend to think about nation states as being outdated or less relevant when mapping to concepts of digital rights or digital citizenship. Uh, but in the particular case of the gig economy, the nation states are often the last stand of legal protection. So companies like Lyft and Uber can have marketing offices in Germany, but they're not able to operate uh, licensed cars. And so I'm wondering, has the gig economy made nation states more relevant, entrenched their importance to relevance in the 21st century? I actually think, uh, kind of combining that with, with the last comment about the unions are struggling to stay relevant, I actually think this kind of uh, produces opportunity for traditional unions to come out of the um, kind of shadows of that very much deliberative focus of behind the door advocacy, behind the door meetings, judiciary advocacy, and so on, into a front line of gaining uh, gaining confidence of the new group of people, whether being students, whether being um, uh, you know single parents who have to stay at home, or so on, who are using these gig economies but are not getting the same protections as traditional workers. So I think that kind of through the work of, and then because those traditional unions are so much attached to the idea of democratic nation states, uh, then I think through that work, I would argue that yes, nation states are more relevant, are becoming more relevant in terms of discussion that uh, discussing those protections and so on, but only through the, via the um, path of traditional unions being involved in uh, more public advocacy and public policy issues. Um, this question is for Amrita, first speaker. I, I was wondering if um, you mentioned that some of the, the gatherings, women are, women are mobilizing through the internet and that's led to maybe occasionally like increased violence where people can see where they're gonna be and so they're, they're targeting these groups. Has there been sort of like a, a counterinsurgency, like, I don't know, an Indian version of Antifa or something who also shows up to like violently defend these groups, or is this leading to bigger clashes, or is it pretty one-sided in that context? Right. I mean, I I wouldn't firstly call these movements big enough uh, to be you know to, at that scale, but um, you know they are uh, restricted to certain uh, you know very public, let's say, student spaces or uh, you know sites of political resistance which are very regular, so I don't see them as massive big um, clashes, but what we are seeing is that women are finding some level of comfort in these online spaces while there continues to be masculinization of online and physical spaces, but they still find, uh, at least in my uh, research, women still were finding this to be more comforting where they could at least avoid you know, physical resistance and were using them as then you know, online sites of protest. And when then, what gives them is the confidence to come out as a group, as a collective, as opposed to individuated selves. So I think that was uh, uh, that was uh, providing for a sense of power as opposed to a sense of uh, weakness. And even in terms of you know uh, these kind of uh, violent clashes, there have been multiple student movements of late India which have led to very violent clashes. But again them being in, in form of a collective has helped them in like let's say lodging FIRs or you know mobilizing other people to think about such issues where there is you know uh, violence from the nation state or from ruling party uh, affiliates and so on. Um, maybe this is a question or, or maybe not um, <laughs> but uh, I have a, a I have a lingering skepticism um, on Rita uh, or Anastasia sorry about uh, the sort of the possibility of a resistant citizenship through multiple selves um, and I'm thinking a lot about the, the invocation of Enumin and the notion of of the authentic uh, origin, right, um, on which that essay is dependent, uh, which becomes really, really troubling when we think about it in terms of citizenship, because you know, if we take just, for example, the, the citizenship in the United States, the history of citizenship is not one that begins with a sort of a coherent, obvious human self, but actually goes through these processes of highly racist, highly misogynist negotiation, and the notion of the, the complete citizen self is one that's much contested and that remains incomplete. 
Um, therefore, if we were to think about uh, the, the self, right, the online self, uh, and the possibility of multiple selves, we can start to think about uh, this this tendency in social media to reconstitute the self, right, and the terms on which uh, the, the self is reconstituted. For example, in these recent reports about Facebook, being able to find you even when you are not present, they are able to reconstitute you from systems of relationships and things that, that are done even when you don't do anything at all, even if you are not an active member of the site. So there's a reconstitution of the citizen self uh, that seems to me to occur on the grounds of the anarcho-capitalist state as opposed to the nation state, uh, which is a, the shift that was kind of discussed in uh, the question that came from over there. Um, and to me, that's that's pretty dystopian uh, and, and doesn't hold out great possibilities for, for resistance. And um, I'm sorry to be skeptical because I don't want to have to be skeptical, but I, mean, I, I wonder sort of how you would respond to that kind of skepticism. Yeah, so I guess uh, part of what I was trying to do uh, with this presentation is to kind of move from pseudonymity as an oppositional term, as like merely like uh, as a, and, and kind of move beyond like the idea of uh, we can obfuscate ourselves or, or separate ourselves out of this situation of the, the massive surveillance apparatus. So, and, and I think for me, the only choice we have is to kind of, uh, see pseudonymity in a kind of more uh, positive terms and kind of celebrate this uh, this idea that we can be multiple selves and this as more of a rhetorical move of uh, instead of seeing this as a form of resistance and only uh, so it, which always kind of puts us on the losing side kind of take uh, take advantage of and kind of fully celebrate this idea that we we, we should be multiple be in different contexts but of course it's we have the we're the party with the less resources in this in this struggle and uh, yeah, it's just a proposal. Thank you. All right, well, I want to thank our wonderful panelists, and I hope you'll join me, and also thank you, the audience. It's some really wonderful questions. That's